evening and lots of good questions afterwards. So I will turn this over to Dean Clarence Lang. All right. Good evening, everybody. Good to see you. Um, I'm Clarence Lang, uh, Susan Welch, Dean of the College of the Liberal Arts at Penn State. And uh, on behalf of the college, I want to thank you for joining us for tonight's virtual presentation by Dr. Eric Plutzer. Um, the college started these virtual presentations during the pandemic um, as a vehicle to stay connected with alumni and friends like you um, and to showcase the timely, the relevant research being conducted by our faculty. So this is a residue of the pandemic, but of course, one of the things that we learned that there were some, um, there, there were some lessons that we learned coming out of the, uh, of the pandemic of things that we didn't have to um, put away. And so this is, um, this is an opportunity to continue some of the creative things that came out of that particular experience. Um, and although the, the, the worst of the pandemic is behind us, thankfully, um, we know that distance and the various obligations that we have can make it difficult to return to campus physically as often as you may like. Uh, may like. So presentations like these offer us um, the opportunity, uh, ways to continue to bring the college and the work of our faculty to you. Uh, so I'm really happy about this and I'm seeing some familiar faces, Elizabeth, Randy, um, others of you, um, Linda, and so forth, but you are all welcome here, whether we've crossed paths recently um, or not. Um, so happy to have you here, happy you're able to, to, to join us. So at this point, um, I wanna introduce Scott Bennett, uh, our college's senior associate dean for research and graduate studies. And then, uh, oh, Randy just came in the house and uh, invite Scott to introduce tonight's speaker. Scott, over to you. Great, thank you, Clarence. and. Uh... Good to see everybody. Uh, I'm Scott Bennett, like Eric, I am a political scientist as well as associate dean in the college. But tonight my role is to introduce our speaker and then to moderate our discussion. Eric will be making his presentation and then we'll have time for questions and discussion. You're gonna be welcome to submit a question anytime through the evening by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and typing your question there. I'll monitor those questions through the evening and we'll try to ask as many as we can following Eric's presentation. And you'll also have a chance to raise your hand and I'll be able to just call on you. And we'll ask that you just uh, please keep your microphones muted until we do call on you later. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Eric Pletzer, who is Liberal Arts Professor of Political Science and Sociology and a member of the Penn State faculty for 30 years. Eric actually got to campus the same time I did. Now it's been, it's been a little while in the department. Eric's research focuses on voter turnout and civic engagement, public opinion, social and education policy, political polarization, and the politics of family, gender, and reproduction. If that's not enough, he's served as principal investigator on numerous grants, including projects supported by funders such as the National Science Foundation, the Russell, Russell Sage Foundation, and the Spencer Foundation. Eric helped launch Penn State's Survey Research Center, sharing its search for an inaugural director. Later, he served for eight years as the center's academic director as well. He subsequently served for two years as associate editor and then eight years as co-editor-in-chief of the journal Public Opinion Quarterly. In that capacity, he's championed transparency by implementing that journal's first replication data policy and editing a special issue on research ethics surrounding sensitive topics. Eric is currently a faculty affiliate of the college's McCourtney Institute for Democracy, and he directs that institute's Mood of the Nation poll. You'll be hearing about that some later, but the Mood of the Nation poll is actually a unique poll nationally. Rather than just asking multiple choice questions, the Mood of the Nation poll gives citizens a series of open-ended questions to which they can respond in their own words. Mood of the Nation enables respondents to truly share what's on their mind and what's most important to them with nuance. And as a result, it allows the poll to capture a unique and much more comprehensive perspective on contemporary American politics than what we often see elsewhere. For anyone who's interested, results from previous polls can be found by visiting the McCourtney Institute's website, which is democracy.psu.edu, and scrolling over the research tab at the top of the page. 
So we're delighted, Eric, that you could join us here tonight to talk more about polling at a time when it's uh, going to be very important very soon. Eric is going to address questions tonight like, are polls still predictive? What do they tell us about ourselves? And should we trust them? And with that, Eric, I will turn it over to you. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks so much, Scott, and um, a very generous introduction. And uh, thanks to uh, Ellen Conkle and the um, uh, alumni relations team and Bill Hester and the communications team and to uh, Dean Lang for supporting these kinds of events. And so I'm delighted to be here and I'm gonna have some slides as, as most faculty would. And um, I'm gonna try to keep my discussion to raise some points to, for about 20 minutes and allow uh, lots of time for, for questions and answers uh, afterwards. And so um, I hope everyone can see my, my title page. And um, the um, so let's get going. So I want to take you back a little bit um, to the 1930s. There was a, a magazine called the Literary Digest um, that at that time, and I think still is the record for the largest circulation um, magazine in US history. And we're talking tens of millions of people um, at that time. And one of the features of the Literary Digest was to have polls um, ongoing and they would uh, invite people they would send out postcards and people would send their postcards back with their their poll answers and um the um polling was very expensive uh for the digest you can imagine that is sending out millions of postcards to subscribers and others um was was not inexpensive um but it was really good for business and to this day, the reason that we have polls is that it helps news organizations uh, tell stories. It brings uh, viewers to news sites. It brings readers to the printed page. And um, it's always important to remember that the, somebody thinks uh, there's a profit in uh, having these polls. And so, um, they draw people um, in, and I think most of you are probably here because you're interested in the upcoming election, and you're, you probably look at polls and are wondering whether they should uh, make you excited or make you worried, and um, you're not alone in that, and that's why polls remain a feature uh, of modern journalism. Um, the, um, and the Literary Digest did uh, very well until... 1936, when they predicted that uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt would not be elected to a second term. And, as, and of course, we all know he uh, was elected four times. And um, you can see that um, in this poll, over 2 million people recorded votes. And the idea here was that the more people, the, the better. At the same time, though, um, there was this uh, fellow you may have heard of named uh, George Gallup, and um, he was operating in a different way. He was interviewing maybe 2,000 people in each poll rather than 2 million people, and he used an approach that he called scientific polling, and unlike the Literary Digest, he correctly predicted that Franklin Roosevelt would win that 1936 election. Um, Gallup actually wasn't very accurate either, however. Um, he predicted that FDR would win by 12 percentage points. And in fact, Roosevelt won 62 to 38, uh, a margin that would be incomprehensible today in a presidential election. And so Gallup's poll was off by 12 percentage points. Gallup's real passion was in opinion polling. Um, Gallup um, this is from 1935. Uh, this very story appeared in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, but I couldn't get a very good copy of that for you. Um, and um, this was concerning um, uh, what we would now call you know, welfare or unemployment compensation um, during the Great Depression. 
And Gallup could show that over time from 1934 to late 1935, um, the support for this welfare spending um, had begun to erode with more and more people saying that it was too much money uh, to spend on, on the nation's poor. Um, this was the type of polling that Gallup believed was really important because it was in between elections. This was a way for the people to voice their opinions and communicate them to folks in Washington um, in between mandates that might occur every four years. Uh, Gallup also used these polls to tell stories, human interest stories um, about uh, Americans and about new technology and the Grand Cooley Dam. Um, and, and that was his real passion. But Gallup needed the presidential election to gain credibility. And he strongly believed that the, the only way that people would believe his public opinion polls is if he could accurately predict presidential elections. Um, you may be surprised that um, presidential election polls today are actually much more accurate than they were in the past. This is a, a graph that was produced by the American Association for Public Opinion Research, um, and it tracked the average, the polling average um, over time. And you know what we can see way over on, on the left um, is that the early polls were biased against Democrats. For four consecutive presidential elections, Gallup underestimated the support that Democratic candidates would, would get. Um, in 1948, in fact, um, Gallup had his own error and uh, predicted that uh, Dewey would defeat Truman in the 1948 election. Um, but over time, you can see that the height of these bars um, is getting smaller and smaller. And over the last few decades, polls have slightly underestimated Republican vote. Um, but the overall error is, is small. Um, how small is it? It kind of depends, right? Um, it's um, our last cycle was by all accounts the most accurate cycle for pollsters um, since 1936. Nevertheless, if you kind of look at the bottom, that you can see that on average, the polls were off by almost 5% for Senate races, almost about 4% for House races, 5% for governor's races. Overall, you know, 5% is better than it was, but it's not close enough to capture a really competitive election. And that's because predicting elections is really, really hard. So why is it hard? Um, pollsters face the, the same dilemmas as almost any business. Um, it's easy to do things that are accurate and cheap, but it won't be fast. It's accurate, it's easy to be fast and accurate, but it won't be cheap. And cheap and fast, Sounds good, but it won't often be accurate. Right? And pollsters have a problem. They need to be fast. Um, that's because public opinion changes. And so the typical poll would be in the field for two days to five days to capture public sentiment at the moment. If you have a po poll that's out there for two weeks, anything can happen. You can have a foreign invasion. You can have a hurricane. Um, and the people before and after that event are going to be thinking about things differently. So pollsters try to uh, be fast. And um, the sponsors of the polls, while they have some pockets, those pockets are not necessarily very deep. Um, and so even for large organizations like the New York Times or the major cable news companies, um, they're, they're not prepared to spend millions of dollars on any particular poll. Uh, polls can be quite accurate. Um, there is one that you probably uh, see reported the first Friday of every month. It comes from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and it gives us our unemployment rate. It's one of two surveys that the Bureau of Labor Statistics conducts to see uh, what the unemployment rate is. 
and it's fast. Uh, they do all of their field work in, in one week, just like the pollsters. And their margin of error, their statistical margin of error is less than one quarter of 1%. Um, of course, the Bureau of Labor Statistics has a, a very large budget. A survey like this each particular month might cost five to $10 million. And that's considered well worth it because folks on Wall Street and hiring managers and people worldwide depend on this number being accurate. So accuracy is possible, uh, but it's really not possible for your typical media organization, even very wealthy ones. Um, horse race polls, unlike public opinion polls, face some additional challenges too. And I'll just go through those kind of quickly. Um, the first challenge is who will turn out? Right? So we know in the United States on a typical presidential election that only about 60 to 65 percent of those who are of voting age and eligible actually vote in a presidential election. Uh, that turns out to be about 80 percent of those who are registered uh, to vote. Um, and so which 80% turn out? There are some folks, and, and maybe a lot of you who are listening, who vote every single election without, without fail. Um, but there are other folks who are registered who are inconsistent. Um, maybe they're not too excited about the candidates. They think both candidates are the same. Um, maybe voting is a challenge for them. Maybe the polling place moved. Maybe they moved. And so figuring out who's going to vote uh, turns out to be very difficult. And without knowing who's going to vote, it's very difficult to predict the, the election. Uh, a second um, element, and this is less and less of a problem, is undecided voters. So if you go back, you go back to the Carter-Reagan uh, election, for example, um, Undecided voters were about 12, 15% of the electorate, and they almost all broke for Ronald Reagan, um, leading the polls that were done about a week before uh, fairly far off. Um, there are many fewer um, undecided voters. Um, probably a lot of you uh, know which party you're going to vote for um, many months from now, no matter who the candidates are, even if the candidate is a potted plant. Um, you may know you're not going to vote for that potted plant's opponent. Um, but there's still a few undecided voters, and it's very difficult to predict how they're going to break, especially at the last minute, when we don't know what's going to happen at, at the last minute, um, like a Planet Hollywood tape or um, a memo from the FBI about a reopened investigation. Uh, so we just don't, don't know these things, and that makes it hard. Um, one of the things that we worry about uh, a lot is that it's hard to get people to participate in polls. So back in the golden age of telephone polling in the 1970s and 1980s, um, most people would read about the Gallup poll and say, I hardly believe that. I've never been asked to be in a poll. And then if the Gallup organization called you at your home in the evening, first you'd didn't have an answering machine and you didn't have you know, a voicemail um, and you would pick up the phone and say, hello, and say, well, this is the Gallup organization and we're interested in your opinion. And people would say, yeah, I've been waiting to tell you my opinion. And back in those days, about 70% of the folks that we could get on the phone would actually agree to do a 12 or 15 minute interview. And uh, now all of you know, you're you know, you're just getting called for everything from marketing uh, calls, um, all sorts of surveys, um, workplace surveys. I think I get one on about every two or three days here at, at Penn State. So people are just overwhelmed. And so it's hard to get people to um, answer questions. And then finally, uh, in the United States, the presidential election is not based on popular vote. It's based on the states. And the states um, are harder to um, poll than, than the nation. 
And that's because each state will have its own little peculiar issues um, that make it difficult to generate samples and adjust those samples. And so all of these things make it really difficult to predict accurately. Um, the, um, and so if election polling is really hard, if it's really hard for the pollsters to get things precise, to really be within one or 2% of what's actually going to happen, um, how should you be thinking about the polls that you see in the, in the news um, that people share with you on social media. Um, and I know, you know, some of you um, will see a poll and get really depressed or really excited. Um, and um, so what I want to talk about is, is, is provide some perspective on how we might think about polls um, that are out there. Um, so the, the first thing I want to emphasize is that reputable pollsters, and I'll get to that in a minute, um, can be trusted to do their best and be transparent. So the, the, these are um, meetings from uh, the uh, convention of the American Association of Public Opinion Research that I go to every spring. Um, when I'm there, the representatives from the leading polling firms, from uh, all the, the major television networks and cable news companies, and uh, legacy print um, companies like the Los Angeles Times and the New York Times are present. Um, the organizations that do the field work for the media organizations are all present. And um, we struggle about, you know, what did we do wrong? What um, can we do better in the next cycle? Uh, how do we get our questions exactly right? How do we reach people? who don't want to talk to pollsters and how can we account for them. And so there are tons of people in the industry who really want to, to get this right. Um, the um, uh, That doesn't really help you in terms of distinguishing, like, how do I know which organization is, is dedicated to, to doing the best job possible? Um, so the American Association for Public Opinion Research um, has something that we call the Transparency Initiative. And the Transparency Initiative is an agreement. It, it, in the olden days, uh, they used to have the Good Housekeeping Seal of Approval. And this is kind of like that. It's uh, for organizations that agree to adhere to certain standards, that they agree to uh, publish the exact wording of every question that they asked the order in which the questions were asked, who is sponsoring the survey, how the sample was collected, how the sample may have been adjusted, um, and, and so on and, and so forth. And there are, I think, now close to 200 members um, who are certified. Um, these include legacy organizations such as uh, ABC News and, and, the, and the Washington Post, uh, among many others. It includes a lot of the college-based polls that you might have seen from Monmouth University or Siena College, um, Muhlenberg College, Franklin and Marshall, uh, Temple University, and, and scores of others are all uh, members of the Transparency Initiative. Um, major nonprofit organizations such as Kaiser Family Foundation, the Public Religion Research Institute. Um, again, these are just examples. Um, and uh, American Public Media Research Labs that the McCourtney Institute partners with to help uh, publicize um, our polling work are all members of this. And um, you could go to the APOR website and look for Transparency Initiative and, and look at the full list of, of organizations. Um, also, um, a lot of the data collectors that are behind the scenes are members. So the SSRS, um, they do polling for CNN, for example. And so you, you wouldn't know that, right? And so this is a little bit hard to navigate. A, a better approach um, is to the go to the pollster ratings at, at 538, um, which um, is a, bought a few years ago by ABC. Um, and they'll rate the, uh, the pollsters and 
Um, the, the poll score is how accurate they've been in the last cycle, um, or the last couple of cycles. The transparency score, though, basically builds in all of the elements from the APOR seal of approval. And so they give a score, um, a, a high score. And you can see that Marquette University Law School, run by uh, Charles Franklin, uh, gets a perfect 10. Um, the UGov, and they do the field work for the McCourtney Institute poll. Uh, they score close to a nine. ABC News is high, and, and these numbers go way down as you, you move down, down the list. We're very happy that our, our uh, field work company was ranked fourth overall. Um, and, um, um, and, and this is a place where you can go, and, and every cycle, the pollsters get rated. And, and so this is a, something that all of you can do if, if you're curious about the reputation of a particular pollster. And, and whether to trust them. But these are all folks that um, adhere to best practices and are doing their best to get things right. Um, unfortunately, even those who are using best practices and have pretty good resources um, simply don't know about a lot of things. So for example, the turnout in 2020 was much higher than any of the pollsters imagined. Um, that both candidates did an incredible job of bringing out their supporters who in previous elections were kind of indifferent and uh, periodic voters. And you could certainly see that here in Center County. If, if you went outside of, of State College to the polling uh, areas that were or just outside of downtown into the more rural areas, uh, people were swamped. And there were a lot of people who hadn't voted in four years, six years, and were about to be given notification that their polling, their registration is going to lapse, who returned. And most of those individuals um, in rural Pennsylvania voted for Donald Trump. And at the same time, there was a surge of uh, particularly young voters who normally have very low voter turnout uh, in other locales uh, that created a record turnout. Um, but these unknowns mean that when you see a margin of error, and in the q and I'd be happy to help explain margin of error if anyone wants to revisit your um, STAT 200 class. Um, but um, typically a, a poll will say that, you know, the margin of error is plus or minus 3%. But in fact, it's these unknowns that we just don't know about who's turning out. Um, we don't know who's going to break late for one candidate or another. That means that in practice, the margin of error for most polls is actually closer to 7% than it is to 3%. And this is because uh, we can't account for, for everything. Um, and the worst thing is the things we can't account for often are the same all over the country and they don't cancel out. So young people had high turnout almost everywhere in the country and young people tended to vote for Biden. And rural Americans uh, had much higher turnout than anticipated everywhere in the country and they tended to vote for, for Donald Trump. And so a lot of these things that we don't know end up being wave phenomena uh, that are just difficult to anticipate. So that's the second reason why we don't always get it right. Um, the third thing I, I want to say is, is try not to get very excited about a single poll. Um, 538 and Real Clear Politics uh, are among the sites that provide polling averages and track those averages over time. So this is uh, the uh, polling average, the dark lines, uh, the polling averages for uh, um, Shapiro and, and uh, Mastriano in the last gubernatorial election in, in Pennsylvania, the dots are the actual poll results. And so you can see the individual poll results are sort of all over the place. And um, here's one that showed the race was three points apart, that uh, Shapiro was only ahead by three percentage points, which would be reported in your local news as being within the margin of error. And so if when this poll comes out, 
you say, oh my goodness, the race is tied, right? It's a statistical tie is what some reporters would have would have said. Um, but that's misleading. We expect by chance um, and due to other th other things uh, to get results that are just out of line with the others. And so try not to get excited about any single poll. And and this this poll, by the way, for those of you who are follow this is is from uh, Rasmussen reports, and um, they they are not among the most accurate pollsters in the, in the country. Um, the other thing I want to emphasize is that sometimes pollsters have trouble getting the level exactly right, but we're much better at getting the trends right. And so this is an amalgamation of presidential approval polls. And what you can see is that in the first 18 months of being in office, the approval for the job that Joe Biden was doing as president fell steadily and gradually. And that's a trend you can trust. So this is a long-term trend. It represents a real disenchantment. There are a bunch of people, um, a majority, more people than actually voted for Joe Biden at the beginning who um, were willing to give him a, a benefit of the doubt and approved of the work he was doing in the first four months of his presidency. And that goodwill sort of, you know, tapered off. And now Joe Biden is sort of stuck right around 40% uh, approval. And so whether that 40% is the same as a 40% approval for Richard Nixon, um, I don't know. Um, but what we do know is, is that goodwill eroded. And, and you can be pretty confident that a trend like this is telling us an important story about uh, American politics. And the, the last thing I want to say before we get into discussion is to, I want to encourage you to not fixate on the horse race polls. You know, like who's ahead? How much? So they were ahead by four points yesterday, five points today. I think that, you know, drive you crazy. Um, and so I want to encourage you to expand your polling diet and um, to enjoy poll results that are more like what Gallup was excited about. That is polls that report on how Americans are thinking about particular challenges. Those polls tend to be more accurate um, and the stories about them uh, tend to be multidimensional. Um, and if that's the type of thing that you're interested in, uh, I think probably the very best place um, to go is, is the, the Pew Research Center. Um, the, the Pew Research Center, um, it's funded by the Pew Charitable Trusts, and as a result, they, they answer to nobody. Um, they are quite nonpartisan. They have terrific professionals who are both good so social scientists and good writers, and they can dig deeply into, you know, what your fellow Americans are thinking um, about issues of the day, about Russia, Ukraine, Israel, um, what's going on at the border. They have longer term stories about long term trends in, in religiosity, for example, and they have a terrific international polling unit uh, where they conduct polls in over 30 countries. And so I think these are more in the spirit of what Gallup was really passionate about and um, um, can be quite valuable to complement your, your eagerness to find out who's ahead um, on any given day. Um, we aspire uh, in our little polling or outfit here at, at Penn State um, to do kind of the same thing. Um, and um, we try to, um, as um, uh, Scott said, use open-ended questions uh, as often as we can to allow citizens to frame their own answers. And, and sometimes they'll, um, um, you know, even talk back to us. And so um, on, on 
one of our one of our longstanding questions um, asks people what they value most about democracy. And every poll, four or five percent of the respondents use their open-ended question not to say what they value most, but to say something like, "We are not a democracy. Get that straight. We are a constitutional republic." And so it allows uh, us to find out streams of thought, and then we'll follow up with that in other polls um, that we wouldn't have gotten if we'd have just used forced choice questions. And so I, I hope you may uh, uh, go to the McCourtney Institute and, and uh, glance at some of our work uh, to expand your, your polling diet as well. And um, with that, um, I'm going to, to stop to allow plenty of time for, for discussion, and I, I look forward to uh, your questions. Great. Thank you, Eric. I, I appreciate that. Um, at this point, we are going to open the floor for questions. If you'd like to submit a question, a reminder, you can click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, type your question there. You can also click the reaction button on the bottom of your screen to uh, virtually raise your hand and I can call on you. I'll ask you to please be brief in your questions uh, so we can uh, take uh, take as many as we can. Um, but Eric, I'm going to take the prerogative as moderator just to ask the, the first question. So you spent a bit of time talking about uh, uh, pollsters that were professional and transparent and had committed to a number of different principles, like revealing their questions and so on. Is the alternative to that good group of pollsters just less competent pollsters, or are there actually kind of dishonest pollsters out there who are trying to lead people in one direction or another? Yeah, so so I, I think, so yes, it is a, there, there is a buyer beware uh, element here, and that actually comes in several flavors. So the first flavor are polls that are released by the campaigns themselves. So you can imagine that campaigns are polling regularly. A, a well-funded campaign uh, will be polling every three or four weeks. Um, and typically those are not released to the public. Those are strategic, like where should we advertise? You know, where should we hold a rally? What should our message be? But by chance, every once in a while, they'll get a poll that will show them very close um, and they'll release those polls. So you, in fact, often a, a candidate will be well ahead, but they'll get a poll that shows it's tied and they will release that poll for reasons of fundraising and eliminating complacency. But because they only release some of them, it's not really a random sample. You can trust these news organizations to publish every poll that they do rather than just pick the ones that tell a particular story. So that's that's the first thing to worry about is, is beware of, of, of partisan polls. The, the second are small organizations um, that do polls on the cheap. And there are small marketing firms um, that do presidential polls because they know it will appear in the 538 list they know it, they might have a press release and get on the local news. And they're doing that to drive business to their marketing um, side. They're doing that to get a name. And what they're hoping is uh, that, you know, they'll be picked up in the news and they'll move up and become a, a brand like Gallup or um, Pew Research Center um, to attract customers. And those pollsters... Um, some of them are doing the best they can, but with very low budgets. There are others that engage in two other kinds of tactics. One is the group that starts with a very low budget and doesn't do very well. And they will tend to not release their polls until they see polls of other companies. And so if they get a kind of wacky result, you know, they may then massage their data and beat it into submission so that they their result is not that different from the result from CBS and the New York Times and Fox News. Um, and we have a name for that, and that's called herding. 
um, and that the, these folks will lag and their margin of error is too, it's statistically impossible because they're so close to everybody else. Um, and so there's definitely evidence of that. Um, and so these tend to be small regional um, marketing firms. I won't name any, but there are some in Pennsylvania um, that want to get this publicity, but don't want to be way out there. And they often get odd results and then change what they're doing um, to get the results to be more in line. And then there are a few pollsters who um, are contrarians and they will gamble that all the other pollsters are going to be wrong in a particular direction. And they will also cook their results to be more pro-Republican or more pro-Democrat than everyone else. And through, throughout the entire campaign, everybody's saying, oh, you guys are wrong. You're five points too Democratic or five points too Republican. And just like penny stock um, folks years ago, they're hoping to hit the jackpot. They're hoping that the fact that those unknown unknowns are going to break their way. And at the end of the year, they're going to be say, we are the nation's most accurate pollster. And every once in a while, they're lucky. And they, and otherwise, people just forget about them. And so there, there are folks out there. Um, and um, back when 538 was better supported uh, financially, uh, they used to call these folks out on a regular basis. But there, there aren't watchdogs. And so um, the, the best way is, is uh, to stick with the legacy pollsters. And if somebody is a maverick saying all the legacy pollsters are wrong, um, there's a good chance that they're trying to bring attention to themselves in, in that particular way. Great. So the more reasons we need to uh, watch who we're watching. So a, a, a question from the audience concerns longitudinal polls. So these would be polls that are tracking the same group of people over repeated interviews and over time. Do longitudinal polls address any of the challenges that you've raised about horse race polling? And are there any reputable panels that would provide good content that we should be watching? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So the University of Southern California, the USC Dornsite poll is, is one such poll. Um, they have a group of, at least in the last cycle, about 5,000 individuals who agree to do a certain number of polls over, over time. And the nice thing about those um, is that everything is held constant, right? So it, it, if um, one polling organization you know, is lucky and gets a lot of homemakers to participate one month, and then the next month, for whatever reason, they, they can't, they're, they're gonna bounce around. Uh, but these are the same folks all the time. Um, if they start with a bias at the beginning, that bias will continue throughout. But it does provide the opportunity to um, see if people are changing their opinions over time. And um, I don't think too many people are changing their opinions on who they're going to support for president. Um, but they may change their opinions in terms of their enthusiasm for the candidates, their likelihood of turning out. Um, and um, those are very good at, at sort of confirming the change that we see in those kind of 538 plots. And so I think the, the USC is, is, is one of the better known ones. And I want to distinguish that from something that may sound like a longitudinal poll, but is not. And, and that are are these large internet panels that enroll 100,000 people. And then each poll, they sample 1,000 of them. Um, and so everyone in that panel agrees to do a certain number of polls, but the answers are not linked over time. So the, the I think increasingly, more and more organizations are going to be moving to something like that or having this kind of component be part of their um, polling scheme because you can invest a lot of time in enrolling somebody in that time and money and financial incentives, um, knowing that they're, that 
that's going to pay off for that same person doing eight or 10 or 12 polls over the, the course of a campaign. Um, so I don't know if the um, person who asked the question had a particular organization in mind, but I think we're going to see more of that. And uh, I think USC has been doing it the longest and is, is, is one of the, the best regarded pollsters that uses that method. Great, thanks. Um, let me again uh, invite the audience, please, if you want to raise your hand, we're uh, happy to, to uh, get some other voices on here. Um, Eric, something that I have always wondered, even though I had stat 235 years ago, uh, is how our surveys of 2000 people can actually reveal as much as they do. You know, we've got millions, hundreds of millions of voters, and yet we're, we have what seem like small numbers, you know, can, can you explain really briefly how that works? And does the fact that we are all kind of so different and so individualistic and have so many different identities and polarizations, has that made those numbers, how many people we need to, to change? Yeah, so um, I could do a whole course on that, and I do. Uh, but the, 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 the simple, I mean, the, the simple answer is um, whether you can get people who are typical of large numbers of other people. And so when you think of a poll, so if we think that there are, you know, let's say 150 million voters, and you have a poll of um, 1,500, then each person in the poll is I've got this right, speaking for 10,000 other voters. And um, and it's 10,000 people like them. And so if I randomly select a, you know, a 30 year old uh, um, Latino um, mother of two, who only has a high school education, who lives in a, a large city in the Northeast, all of the things that have molded that person are unique, but that person shares certain things with other 20 to 30 year old Latino parents in that region of the country in large cities. And so on average, it's kind of like a jury. That is, we have a jury of our peers and we hope that when we randomly select people from a a list of driver's licenses or, or voter rolls, that they're in some sense um, representing everyone. The, the math of it depends on whether we can overcome that clustering. So it's true that people who are have distinct political attitudes tend to live in the same communities. They tend to have certain traits and that makes it dangerous if we were just trying to get a thousand people by, you know, walking, um, you know, along the Lincoln Highway. The first thousand people that we came across between here and Pittsburgh, you know, that would be that wouldn't be a, a, a very good sample. And if we got the first thousand people we came across in Times Square, that wouldn't be a very good sample. And so the idea is to simulate what would be a mix, a mixing up, and you know. I don't know the last time you, you went to the doctor's office, you know, they didn't ask you for, you know, all 16 pints of blood uh, or whatever, you know, they, they just took a little thimble and, and that's because your blood is mixed up. That is the, the blood that happened to be, you know, you know, had a pinprick in your finger or in your arm at that moment is representative of all of the blood in your body. So if other, if, you know, if we didn't have random sampling, you know, going in for a blood test would be pretty grim. Um, and so it's the same principle in um, polling, except we need to avoid just getting one cluster of people that are the same. And it's the equivalent of this mixing that we try to accomplish by getting just a few people from this county and a few people from this county and making sure that we vary from rural counties to urban counties, young and old, that we approximate that mixing that happens in your body that allows us to 
you know, just prick your finger uh, for a lot of blood tests and still be very accurate. So I don't know if that's, I could get more into the math, but but we're, we're aware that these are challenges. And um, if you read any poll report, it will also say in the fine print that the poll has been adjusted in, in some ways. Um, and typically that means if we get a poll and only 8% of our respondents are African-American, and we know that African-Americans comprise about 13% of the adults in the United States, we need to amplify their voice. That is, we've underrepresented African-Americans in our poll. If we get um, all 50% of our poll being saying they're married, but we know that only about 40% of adults in the United States are, are married, then we've given too much voice to, to married Americans. And so that's the kind of statistical adjustment that we do. And hopefully, you know, it's it's done in a principled way. Um, and I devote about four weeks of my graduate seminar uh, on survey analysis to figuring out how to do that right. And it, it's not as easy as it sounds, um, but in general, that helps a great deal to avoid the problems of accidentally getting a cluster of people that are all the same. No, that's super intuitive. So that's that's uh, very helpful. Um, we're coming up on uh, uh, our time in a few minutes. So let me uh, ask again, see if somebody wants to ask a question in the room. Otherwise, I'll ask um, another one. But let me give everyone a second. Take probably one more question. Dean Lang has a question. It's not a good one, Eric, but I'm going to throw it in uh, any anyway. And so, um, and I'm a humanist, so let me let me start with 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 that. So we work in very different kinds of ways. Um, I'm just really curious about um, you know those colleagues who are like you working with polls, working with with big data. You know, what does that mean at a historical moment? Where we can't even assume, we can't seem to even agree on what are basic facts, and so to to some extent, who are the consumers of poll data as best as you can can tell? Because it seems to me that there's a lot of skepticism, um, since people are prone to increasingly to read things through particular political prisms and dismiss the things that don't comport with that. So in some ways, you know, mine is more of a an existential question about what does big data mean at a moment of such political polarization, um, where it's easy to pick and choose what reality is. That's a poorly worded question, but I hope it is legible enough um, to give you something to respond to. No, absolutely. And you know, there, of course, there's no such thing as a bad question, Dean. <laughs> so that's, uh, uh, the, um, so, you know, you raise a number of points. And, and so what is the purpose of polling? Um, so certainly the pollsters who work for campaigns, they are very transactional and strategic. They just want to test messages and, and see what's effective. The newspapers, to some extent, need to have things that are interesting and draw people to their, their new sites and to their print editions. And something that is counterintuitive or focuses on conflict is always draws readers. So it, it, that's always an underlying motivation, I think, even if it's not conscious uh, by the folks um, who are making the editorial decisions. And that's why horse race polls, you know, it's, it's like watching the big game, right? Who's ahead in the first quarter? Who's ahead in the second quarter? And I, I as I said, I don't, think you want to make your your poll diet entirely based on on that. I think um, there are two ways that I think polls um, can be helpful in in some larger sense. One is is Gallup's dream that it, it holds elected officials accountable. And so if there some I mean if we can show that there is a clear majority, favoring some particular policy, 
Uh, that doesn't mean the elected officials need to blow in the wind and do whatever the, the polls say, but it, it amplifies the voices of people that are not lobbyists, uh, that are not inside the room when it happens. And so when, when there are clear majorities, regardless of how we word our questions and so on, on um, you know, issues uh, uh, like minimum wage would be one where there's uh, overwhelming majorities. Um, you know, I think that's important in sending a signal um, to uh, politicians but those politicians need to know that sometimes people are thinking off the top of their their heads. That is, some some policies are complicated, and, and the public hasn't had a chance to digest things. And um, but I think that's the first is just to give voice to what's on people's minds um, at any particular time. And the second, and I don't think this is an an, an essential goal, but I think it's one that we serve in in this particular moment is that polls over the last eight or 10 years have tended to show that uh, liberals and conservatives um, agree a lot more than would be evident uh, if you judge polarization entirely from your social media feed um, or from the, the evening headlines. Um, we, uh, we've run polls on, uh, let's say, uh, gun regulation, and um, gun owners in our sample um, who are strong supporters of the Second Amendment uh, support an array of policies um, related to training um, and gun safety, for example, um, that I think most liberals would think would be terrific if they could be enacted. Um, I think the, the a more challenging issue or reproductive rights where we see a, a lot of ambivalence um, that when, when push comes to shove, people will vote for the pro-life candidate or the pro-choice candidate. Um, but we can demonstrate that actually there's room in the middle to, to talk if people are willing to, uh, to do that. And all pollsters can do is, is provide this information and it's up to the leaders uh, on campus um, and in, in Washington and in, in Harrisburg uh, to go with that. You know, we, we can't um, make elites do any particular thing, but we can demonstrate that on many issues, there is a lot less polarization um, than it, it might seem. And, um, and so I, I guess in, in this moment, that's one, one reason to continue to do polls uh, because we can tell that that kind of story. Thank you, Eric. Thanks, Eric. That's uh, super, super helpful and interesting. Um, we are going to wrap up our evening there. This is the first event of this kind that we've done in a while. We're really delighted that you were able to join us. And please watch for, for more of these. We have um, a number of, of exciting folks who have volunteered from the college to speak with our alums. And so uh, keep your eyes open for information about those other events. Uh, thanks to our audience for submitting your questions and joining us tonight. Thanks again, Eric, for giving us some insight. We're going to be seeing a lot of polling over the next eight months, I am sure. They will largely be horse race polls, but we can try to look behind them a little bit. And I think we're going to be, um, I know I'm going to be a little bit more ready to interpret what I'm seeing and actually even to share some insights with our, our friends and family and neighbors to the Dean's question, knowing that polls can actually be accurate and that there is less polarization than they are showing, I think is a, are, are two valuable messages at this at this time. So thanks for, for leaving us with that. So everyone, thank you for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your evening and we'll see you at another event soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.